and we're live. Welcome back to another episode of the Cone Studios podcast. Today we'll be covering common arguments regarding the Anthropocene epoch, a currently unofficial unit of geologic time. We'll be going over the evidence for and against classifying the Anthropocene as an official epoch in geologic history when the official start date of the Anthropocene should be, and the future of humanity in the Anthropocene, and how the epic might end. Joining us today on January 14th is local Twitter enthusiast and influencer, Jacob Cry. Welcome to the show, Jacob. I'm glad to be here. I'm happy to talk about the Anthropocene with you on this podcast today for Cone Studios. Always glad to have you. So, Jacob you've been quite the advocate for making the Anthropocene an official epic in geologic history, helping to raise awareness and generate support for the cause. Would you mind talking a little about the reasons why you and your following believe the legitima- believe in the legitimization of the Anthropocene? Yeah, for sure, but I think first for our audience, just for context's sake, that we should clarify what we mean when we say Anthropocene. Of course. All right, so the Anthropocene is just another ep- epic and as you can see, let's pull up the, this table there. Uh, we've had a, quite a few epics before, and the current one, um, the last official one actually, was the Holocene. So an epic is just simply a period of time on a geological scale, so you can see there's quite a few there. And the Anthropocene is simply the age of man, or the time of man. Um, and so the argument for this is that humans have had such an impact even on a geological scale as large as this one that it should be defined as its own epic. Okay, okay. So what are some of the reasons why we could, why we're not, we shouldn't be classified as in the Holocene? So the way that we define it is extremely important here, but there has been many impacts by humans that if let's say, an alien race or a future civilization look back, they would be able to see in our geological time scale here, like in the rock formations or in the fossil records, that something happened here and that something is man. Um, and so, what evidence do we have for this? The main one is anthropogenic climate change, which you probably heard talked about in the news, of course, politicians, you know. Um, what you see here is this massive emissions of greenhouse gases and such as like CO2 into the atmosphere at such um, a high volume that it actually impacts how rock layers form and how rock layers would look in this. Um, all right, all right. Now beyond this is also the fossil record, which is more like a subcategory of this. Um, and in the fossil record, what we're looking for is uh, most importantly, how species go extinct, or more importantly, how frequently these species go extinct. So on average, um, there's this thing that scientists call the background extinction rate, and that is just the average um, amount of species that go extinct every 100 years. Uh, And when we see a large spike in the rate of extinction in the fossil records, we consider this an extinction event. And so there's been five extinction events before this, and scientists today consider this to be the sixth extinction event in the fossil record. So what do we consider as going extinct? As going extinct, as far as the definition goes, it's just the amount of species, and more importantly, the mammalian species that are that we see going extinct. And at the rate of which, currently, we think it's about 10 to 100 times more um, frequently that these um, species are going extinct than the background extinction rate. So this is um, to the point where it would be very obvious in the fossil records, looking back, that there was some event that was going on here. Ah, of course, of course. So, what would you say to some of the... There's a lot of disagreements between scientists out there. They're saying, you know, the Anthropocene is too short. It's more of a geologic event, human extinction, and we might not even be able to tell that that humans existed on the face of the Earth in a certain amount of time. What would you say to those scientists who are Anthropocene deniers, as we call them? So, yeah, I noticed um, one article by the Atlanta even called it a joke, but... What I see with these Anthropocene deniers is they're more focused on the artifacts of humans rather than our actual impact. And by impact, I mean our impact on, you know, like the fossil record, like I talked about, or the the rock formation. 
And so what they focus on is like, for example, nuclear waste. So nuclear waste, they, they claim, would even be, that we talk about is like lasting forever. They claim that even that would be gone in the next 10 to 100,000 years. Um, they also talk about how records of human history and like even our tallest buildings and these monuments that we've built um, will be wiped out similar to how, you know, like mountains have been leveled over time. They, they make that analogy. But I think the argument for the, the Anthropocene isn't the artifacts, but rather the impact. Excellent. Good stuff. So now let's get into the more specific stuff. So the Anthropocene, we say it's after the Holocene. Where do you consider the end of the Holocene and the beginning of the Anthropocene? Well, let's take a step back here. There's a few different starting points um, that scientists have discussed. So the first one would be the start of the first agricultural revolution and the start of society. The second main one is the start of the industrial revolution. And then the third one would be about the nuclear age when um, carbon emissions and get greenhouse emissions started to really spike. So the agricultural revolution is considered the start because simply it is the start of society and therefore the start of modern man as we consider it. But as far as our actual impacts on our environment go, it isn't that prevalent, and so I don't consider that a reasonable starting point. Um, where I consider the start to be is the Industrial Revolution. Um, so there you see this move into these urban cities and this large amplification for the first time of these carbon emissions through like factories and rapid industrialization of society. Do you think that's where the real spike in global climate change began? Well, I think there is some evidence for it. that's at least the beginning of the spike. Yeah, for sure. You know, I've I've heard some sources. They're they're starting to think that, you know, when you look at a graph of the global climate change over here. Hey, Jamie, can we pull that up? So, so you can see around the nineteen, up until the nineteen fifties, from eighteen fifty, it's kind of a steady increase, but then it starts exponentially increasing around nineteen fifty. And I think I've heard I've heard that's in some part to do with the rapid globalization of industry. Can you expand on that? For sure. Um, and that's led, another start point I talked about was like the nuclear age, where after these world wars, there was this globalization, like you yeah. mentioned. And so what we saw with the Industrial Revolution was different because you only saw the industrialization of like a few large powers. But with the 1950s, as you pointed out, is more of a global expanse, right? You have these poor third world countries um, able to industrialize and starting to industrialize um, and with all of with this like mass amount of industrialization just like the global industrialization you can obviously see the impacts um, on the graph and how much the carbon emissions alone have spiked not, a, not even counting the other greenhouse gases from farming for sure for sure and keep in mind during the industrial revolution as you can see in the graph we weren't mining and burning as much oil as we are now Petroleum mining, fracking, that really started to kick off in the 1950s. You can see that it's exponentially increased, increased over the years, and so forth. Next, let's move on. I would like to talk a, bit, a little bit about how, you know, what's next for the Anthropocene. Um, we, we figured out the start date, where we are now. So we're kind of moving on this thing called the 21st century bottleneck. And could you expand on that? and how humans are going to kind of get through that. So scientists describe this as one of the bottlenecks. Um, and what a bottleneck simply is, is it's, just, it's kind of a squeeze and we need to work together as humans to, to just like push through it. And once we get through it, um, or if we get through it rather, then from there they say there could be, you know, far more um, advent of technology and stuff. And so this kind of brings us to what the end of the Anthropocene is, or the future of the Anthropocene will bring. Um, a lot of scientists, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, it's a bit of doom and gloom, but they worry that, and realistically, they worry that this climate change, this runaway climate change specifically, as you see on the graph, for sure, um, is, is gonna, you know, just couple with all of our current problems with like starvation and infrastructure. With this climate change, it's more than just you know the ice caps melting. Yeah, you know it's, sure. it's it's impacting all aspects of our food sources. You know, with temperature increase, farming becomes more difficult. So, so you're saying it's 
climate change has a larger impact than people on the coast just having to sell their houses and move. Exactly, exactly. Um, and and people sometimes will fail to realize this, even though scientists have been like claiming all this. And this brings us to my most important point: is that hopefully, and as scientists, you know, like this may be one of our only hopes, is that some technology or some group of technology and progression will save us. But for that to happen, people need to start listening to you know scientists and, and experts in their fields rather than like media or politicians. For sure. What kind of what do you think this tech kind of this te- technology could be? It could be. I think the most important thing is it's, it'll be some it'll be some energy, right? It could be an, it could be a vast improvement on the current energy, such as like uh, people are looking at like nuclear reactors or like fusion. Um, they're also looking at um, like better and improving solar energies, right? But I really do think it's just going to be the saving technology will be some or renewable resource, some new renewable energy source, or some improvement on a current renewable energy source. <laughs> because as you can see here, the the majority of these carbon emissions are coming simply from non from non renewable. Exactly. Yeah. So we need to be able to eliminate the use of those, or at least bring it down you know all right kind of turning around here sometimes sometimes some sorry some scientists are saying you know we if that kind of technological miracle doesn't happen we just kind of turn around and go the other way kind of a return to to return to monkey as you will if you will yeah Yeah, that that's an interesting point it is an interesting theory as well because yeah if our technology doesn't save us then we might have no other choice but this more descent back towards our subsistence living, you know, living, you know, kind of like people say, like monkeys, you know. Yeah. But, you know, you can imagine monkeys happy. You know, yes, for sure, for sure. Making their monkey yeah. noises. Like, Indus River Valley, Mesopotamia, Yeah. except with technology, of course. Yeah, we'll still, we'll still have our technology, but it's just the progression and the globalization, as you've said, will be, of le- course, could be less after this yes. decline. Yes, of course. Now, is there some sort, neither of those options, you know, both are, one's risky, one's really, one's really, I don't, I don't want to go back to subsistence living. Is there a middle path? You know, I, it's more philosophical, but I do tend to think that we can somehow preserve our connection to nature and preserve like the subsistence, like, you know, connection to monkey, right? Yeah. Where, but within that, we can use that connection with our progression in technology to still be able to progress without further damaging our environment and the place in which we live, hurting ourselves, right? Yeah, and that would be the ideal path is is a combination of the progression of technology as well as being more cautious around Mother Earth. Exactly. Unification, you know, between all humans. Exactly. That's our goal. Okay, S- sadly, that brings us to the end of our session. Jacob, always a pleasure to have you on the show great seeing you. You know, it's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to talk with you. Um, do you want to recap what we went over? Of course, of course. To recap what we just went over, which was the Anthropocene epic. Hopefully you learned something about that. It was an unofficial unit of geologic time. We talked about the legitimacy of the epic and the official start date, and also the future of the Anthropocene and the future of humanity. This has been an episode of the Cone Studios podcast. And to leave you with a final thought, we would like to ask the audience a related question. Does humanity deserve to survive? We'll see you next time.